Hello, everyone. This is Lisa Levinson. I'll be your guide through this webinar this evening. Uh, tonight, we have a webinar called Despair Repair with uh, vegan activist Ray Sakura, and I'll give you a little bit more details about that in a while. First, I'll just share uh, my, my um, role in this. I'm the person who's going to host the webinar, and a little bit about myself. Uh, as I mentioned, I'm Lisa Levinson. I'm the director of the Sustainable Activism Campaign for Indefensive Animals. And we provide emotional and spiritual resources for animal activists. And this webinar today is one of those resources for you. Uh, you can find other resources on our events page, which is www.idausa.org slash events, and I posted that in the chat box. And on that page, you'll see all kinds of resources, such as tips, uh, video tips, uh, which Ray did one of our video tips. We also have uh, webinars once a month, and we have vegan spirituality online gatherings also once a month. And we just started last month an animal activist online support group, which meets on the fourth Thursday of the month, where we have an opportunity to talk amongst ourselves and to have what we might call peer supervision or an opportunity to uh, connect and share what, what issues are going on in our lives about our activism. So we hope that all of these resources are ones that you'll find beneficial and that you can use them. Most of them are free. We do have in-person events such as vegan spirituality retreats. So we had an activist healing retreat in 2015. So stay tuned for more events. Uh, those are um, usually in a regional area. So hopefully we'll do one in your area sometime soon. So one other last announcement is that we have uh, not only group opportunities to connect, but we also have one-on-one -on -one uh, a helpline service, which is there for you. If you're having any concerns about your life or about activism, it's actually counseling. And the, the therapists on the other end of the phone line are animal activists, just like yourself, um, with training specifically in either psychotherapy or nonviolent communication. Um, but they're, it's a great resource, and I hope you'll, you'll check that out. Um, I put a link to the helpline on the chat box, but the phone number is 1-800-705-0425. So hopefully you can call that when you need to. So without any further ado, I'm going to introduce uh, Ray Sakura, who I'll give you her bio, but I will also tell you that she's a dear friend of mine. So it's truly an honor to have her on the webinar as our guest. It's a real treat. So Ray Sakura has been a full-time spokesperson for other species and the environment for over 35 years. She is co-founder of Plant Peace Daily, Veg Fund, and the Institute for Humane Education. Ray leads compassionate living and ethical consumerism programs internationally for diverse audiences ranging from schools and prisons to businesses and universities. So she is very well qualified to share her wisdom with us today. It's a real treat, uh, Ray, to have you here. So you can see her if you're on uh, online with us. She's sitting next to me uh, through the, the internet waves anyway. <laughs> so Ray, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Oh, my pleasure. I wish I was sitting next to you for real, <laughs> not Aww, just on the computer. Yeah. So I first want to just to make I want to make sure that it works. If I um, use the phone on speakerphone, I want to make sure that everyone can hear me. So if you can't hear me clearly at any point, um, just let us know. You can let us know through the chat box, right, Lisa? Yes. Thank you for mentioning that. Anybody can communicate to either of us via the chat box. You can type a message and let. And it's fine if everyone shares on the chat box. That's a, another way we create community here. Um, but it's helpful to us also, if you're having any technical issues, please let us know and we can try to troubleshoot them. And that would be my job. Um, 
And so that's, that's an important feature of the chat box, but we also have later in our program, we'll do a Q and A where we're all give you instructions on how to unmute yourself so that we can all um, uh, have a time to ask Ray different questions. So, and I will also let you know that everyone who signed up for this webinar will get a replay link with the video following the webinar, probably in a week or so. So I just, this is a, a great way also to stay connected, whether you're with us in, in the moment or uh, if you, you can check into it afterwards as well and, and listen to the resources again. Okay, so Ray, would you like to um, have me put the webinar PowerPoint on or? Sure, you can pop the PowerPoint up. Okie dokie. For those who are on my phone, if there's an image that you just have to know what it is, I will describe it for you. So you're not missing out. You And you will get that image in your email when the PowerPoint's emailed to you. Thank you, yeah. Lisa. Oh, you're so welcome. You're very welcome. So we'll go ahead and open up the presentation. And for those of you who'd like to download it right now in the chat box, there is a link to the presentation, and you can also watch um, on the computer. There's a, a maximize button. If you hover over where it says despair repair to the right of that, if you'd like to see the presentation a little larger, you can click the maximize button to the right of the title despair repair um, on your screen right now, and that will give you a little more view. Um, but at this point, I'm going to sign off, and I'll join you again when we do the Q&A. So, Ray, please um, take okay, it, take thank it you away. Everything, Lisa. <laughs> thank you so oh, much. Oh, you're so welcome. So welcome, everyone. I see that we have 38 people online and 16 on phone. So I'm sure that other people are going to be joining us throughout. So, you know, when Lisa just said that I was qualified, to do this. She said all these different things about my past or organizations that I've started. What she didn't say is that what makes me the most qualified to do this is that I have gone through despair. And like many of you, I have cycled through despair, finding tools to get out of it, despair again. Uh, it can sneak up on you. And I want to talk about all these different elements of despair what it is, uh, some, what causes it, some simple tools that you can take away that will hopefully help you to not have to go through it as often and possibly never again. Uh, it just depends. It's a very individual thing. So there are different levels of despair, of grief, and there are definitely signs that you want to watch in yourself. I think one of the first signs is sort of a, a lack of enthusiasm and a lack of energy for life. Um, so if you have felt that, just it's sort of a feeling of what's the point? Like what is the point? It's all going to hell in a handbasket. I give up. So it's this just sort of lack of joy. Um, the next level of it can be, and I know a lot of you can relate to this. I wish you were just all sitting here with me in my office, that would be the best because then we could talk about it. Um, I think that the next level that it can go to can be um, sort of this advanced place where you're feeling like, I hate humans um, and I want to get off the planet. And I know that not all of you can relate to this, but I know that many of you can relate to it because I have at conferences when I have done the despair repair presentation, I've gotten to interact with people and find out just what is going on with them. Um, so I'm not going to sugarcoat this. Uh, really, we have to be really strong. And when we're looking at despair, what I want everyone to realize is that your despair, your sadness, does not help the earth, it doesn't help the animals, and it doesn't help you. It actually can do quite the opposite. It can disempower you. It can make you uh, less able to care for yourself. It can make you um, 
less effective in all you do, in your outreach, in your activism, in your education, and it keeps you from being a powerful, loving, healthy voice for all life. Uh, I, I just think that that's a really important aspect of it to realize very often uh, people who are in despair are the very people who care the most. And that despair, that sadness, it's, it's not effective. It is not doing the planet any good. I'm going to click along here. This is one of my absolute favorite uh, sayings. It says, for those of you who can't see the PowerPoint, I'm going to read it to you. It's a Jack Cornfield quote, and it says, To open your heart like a Buddha, we must embrace the 10,000 joys and the 10,000 sorrows. And that's the reality of life on Earth. Uh, we're going to spend our life very frustrated if we think that we can erase the 10,000 sorrows uh-huh. and only <laughs> have 10,000 joys, that we're only going to have the joys. So um, right now on the PowerPoint, what there is is a, uh, it's a definition of despair, one definition. It's a profound feeling that there is no hope. And this this idea that despair is caused by outside events is what trips a lot of people up because despair is not caused by outside events. Despair is caused by our reaction to those events and our thoughts about those events. And that's a really important distinction because a lot of us might think, oh, if only the planet was different, then I would feel no despair. But this is it's pointless. It is pointless because the earth is what it is and the earth has some suffering. It's part of, I call it the earth curriculum. And um, so it's earth school. And a lot of us, probably all of us, but I don't know, maybe somebody does remember signing up for earth school. I do not remember signing up for earth school. And it has some challenges to it. So I want to give you a little bit of proof that despair isn't caused by these outside events, but it's actually brought on by our reaction to and our thoughts about these events. And it's a very simple proof. And the proof is that if it was caused by those events, then everyone who was witnessing those events would feel the despair when they look at the same situation. But the reality is that that you can have 100 people looking at an event looking at a situation, and they're going to have a hundred different reactions. Some of them may feel despair. Some of them may feel nothing. So it's not that actual event that is causing the despair. So a lot of people have told me that what causes their despair is that there are people who have sort of a hierarchy. They think that some life is more valuable than other life. And they have a hierarchy of caring. And when people have told me this, I I have asked them, do you have a hierarchy of caring? And they say, no, I care equally about all beings. So I'm going to challenge this because I think we all have different levels of caring for different beings. Um, So I'm going to ask you to do something. Um, I'm going to ask you to close your eyes right now. And I'm going to take you through sort of a scenario. So imagine you're working in a garden. And if you've worked in a garden, you know what a tiller is, a rototiller. Even if you haven't worked in one, you probably know what a tiller is. It has blades and it uh, works the earth up. It turns the earth. So you are in the garden and you're tilling the soil. And your tiller hits an earthworm. And you see that you have just killed an earthworm with the tiller. So you feel bad. Now imagine you keep tilling and then you hit a large frog and the frog is completely cut in half and killed. Now your sadness is deeper. So now imagine you keep tilling and now you hit a rabbit. You are in absolute grief. The amount of sadness that you feel for each of these beings is different. It's at a different level of grief. 
you can open your eyes now. I just wanted you to really picture this. So we all have beings that we relate to deeper than others. So we may think we care about all beings equally, but the reality is that we don't. I mean, mostly we care about those who are who we can relate to the most, who are the closest to us. We have our own sort of hierarchy of more caring versus less caring. Um, and I think that realizing that is really important because it can really help us to not judge the world and others quite so harshly because we can be very, very judgmental um, of really of anyone who doesn't care about beings in the same way that we do. So <laughs> for those of you who are viewing a PowerPoint, you're going to see that there's a, a beautiful little sleeping piglet, little pink-eared piglet, and it says on this PowerPoint, one side of the room. So I want to talk about what we're focusing on, what we choose to focus on. And it's very, very important to think about what you choose to focus on. So again, I want you to imagine that you're somewhere, you are in a room, and on one side of the room is this beautiful sleeping piglet. Eyes closed, adorable, picture of innocence. So that's on one side of the room. On the other side of the room is a very large spider on the wall who's very active, moving a lot. So in this moment that you're in this room, it's very, very hard to focus on the beauty of the piglet because fear is making you focus on the spider. This is what we do in life. We focus a lot on what we fear the most. The problem with this is that it causes us a lot of suffering. And a lot of human suffering comes from, and maybe all human suffering comes from, desire and preference. I want this, I don't want this. So we have an aversion to something, or we have a desire for something else. And this is where all of our suffering comes from. If we could just look at the world around us and say, oh, I accept it just as it is. It's wonderful. Everything. That we would accept everything in the world without having an aversion to one thing or a preference for another thing. We wouldn't have suffering. But this is nearly impossible. It's sort of our human condition. But what we can think about is what are we focusing on. There's this really beautiful story, uh, a Native American leader, a tribal chief, named Willa Mankiller. She, she's just been an amazing teacher. And Willa uh, wears this necklace, and the necklace has the head of two wolves on it. And a little boy came up to her and said, what are the two wolves? And he said, and she said to him, oh, one is fear and one is love. And he said, oh, which one is the strongest? And she said, whichever one I feed the most. And I love this story of the boy asking her that in her response, because this is how it is in life. What are we feeding the most? What are we focusing on? You know, we have this time on Earth. It's an amazing planet. Really, it's a short visit. If you look at the, the history of time, we're just here for a little while. And, and we get to choose. What are we going to focus on? What is our life going to be? Is our life going to be based in fear? Or is our life going to be based in love and being an invitation to a possibility while we're here and joy? So I'm going to ask you this, and I won't get to hear your, your responses, unfortunately, but... Um, how many of you have been online and you see that there's a link and you know you shouldn't go to that link because that link has animal suffering. You know it from the heading. You know you shouldn't go there. You know it's going to be sad and you go there. You look at what is on that link online, on Facebook or it came in the email or it came in a newsletter. And you go to it, even though you may be someone who isn't supporting this industry, you make yourself go there to that link 
to witness once again the suffering when it's not necessary. You know, a lot of people will say to me, oh, you know, I would love to come to your program. Does it have anything graphic? And I'll say, well, you know, yes, it has some graphic elements, if it does. And they'll say, oh, I can't look at anything graphic. And I say, fantastic. If you are not supporting the industry, it's not necessary to witness that cruelty. But if you're someone who is supporting the industry, it's very important that you be willing to witness what you're willing to support. If you're not willing to witness it, you shouldn't be willing to support it. So most of the people who are on this call, I'm assuming that your despair comes from what you have witnessed, either personally or online or what you've heard about. Um, you know, I'm, I'm assuming that all of you have witnessed parts of the planet that have caused you to feel like it's hopeless. And, and we're going to talk about that because we can't always avoid seeing the suffering on the planet um, as part of life here. But the times when you can choose to not witness that suffering, it's very important that you do that for yourself. That's self-care. And it's very, very important. So I want to talk about this focus of ours and also the stories that we have, the internal stories that we have. So a lot of the internal story that will cause us grief and despair is that people aren't good. People are horrible. They don't care. They're not compassionate. And when we have that story, we find proof of that story. So I want to introduce you to the idea that, in fact, people at their core are compassionate. And it shows up in different ways for people, depending on what your experience is, your history, your culture. You know, I've worked with people from many, many different cultures. And I can guarantee you that every one of these people wakes up in the morning and tries to do their best with what they know. But I want to give you some examples of just what I witnessed very recently that proved to me that at their core, people are compassionate. So I have this little dog up here. And I was in the parking lot of the food co-op here in Santa Fe. And this little dog was trapped in a hot sunny car. And the person had gone into this building, the food cost there, the county office is there, all these things are there. And so somebody left this dog in a hot car. One person did that. Eleven people were outside that car working to get the dog out and had called animal control to come and deal with the person who had left the dog in there. Look at that ratio, the 11 to one. Eleven people stopped what they were doing in their day and said, this is a situation I am going to take care of. One person foolishly left the dog in the car. Um, also recently I was driving down a busy road here at night and a dog was hit on the road by the vehicle just in front of me. And that vehicle actually took off. After hitting the dog, they did not stop. And what happened next was amazing to me. Like, I stopped, and I was protecting the dog, and then there were probably 30 people who had stopped their vehicles and who were around me. Another guy had taken off to go see who the hit-and-run person was to go report them. There was this huge community. This was in a community that is considered to be not caring for animals. The culture in this area is a culture that is judged harshly for the way that they treat animals. And yet all these people stopped and people were out of their cars and they were on the ground and they wanted to help. They wanted to do something for this dog. And the most recent proof that I had that people are compassionate at their core is when I was just driving back from southern New Mexico and my engine light kept coming on, so I kept pulling off the highway. 
and going into a gas station and checking different fluid levels. And every time I stopped and lifted the hood of my car at the gas station, my car would be surrounded by people wanting to help every single time. So what I feel like is that it's really important that we don't just focus on the parts of humans that upsets us, that we see as less than caring, and that in fact we're willing to shift that focus around a little bit, to shift our focus to the most joyful and loving parts of the planet. And it's not always easy. You know, it can be very, very tough. Uh, Just this morning, we had a blizzard here, which is very unusual for this time of year. And I had arranged to go rescue two dogs. There are some people who live about an hour and a half from here, and we learned that they had dogs who had been on metal chains with no shelter over them for the last four years, out in the mud, um, no protection from the weather at all. One uh, pit bull and one really cute little healer. So, you know, I I went to go (laughs) pick these dogs up today because they agreed to surrender the dogs. And I went to go pick up the dogs, and the person whose dogs they had been was there. And I talked to him for quite a while, and he has farmed animals, and and we talked about it. And I said, you know, what happened? What happened here? You know, and originally when you got the animals, he said, oh, they were working animals. You know, and one was my son's dog, and he, you know, stopped having any interest in him. And I and we just talked about it for quite a while, and he looked right at me. He looked me right in the eye, and he said, I feel bad about this. And I said, what do you feel bad about? And he said that it's come to this, that I didn't take better care of them. And I said, well, recognizing that and being willing to let them go to new homes is a beautiful thing to do. You know? And you can feel good about that step, that you're taking that step that you're willing to let them go to good homes. And then, you know, I also saw that he had other animals there. He had um, turkeys and sheep and ducks and all these other animals. And I said, have you lost interest in those animals or will you care for them? And he said, well, uh, you know, I, I have to talk to my wife. We have kind of lost interest in them. And I said, because I can come back and get those animals. But what I feel like we get to do, we get to speak to the most compassionate part of people. Um, For those of you who have been on different webinars with me before, you know that one of my, really my favorite tools and, and probably the most effective tool in dealing with other humans is that rather than trying to always be understood, that it's very important to understand, to focus on that to really want to understand who is this that I'm across from and to speak to their compassionate heart because they have it in there. Sometimes it's buried a little bit deeper than other times, but they have that compassionate heart. So, you know, one example, I don't know, some of you may have heard this, but that this was this year and here in Santa Fe and um, JC and I were going to the hardware store and this couple was coming out of the hardware store, a man and a woman and they were wearing full length fur coats and I said, oh JC JC is my partner and I said, JC I'll see you in the store, I'm going to talk to these folks oh no, no, he said I'll wait out here, I want to see what happens and so I followed these folks to their car and when I got to their car I saw that it was a fancy little convertible with Florida license plate and it was the dolphin plate so they had paid extra for the dolphin plate and I found that interesting <laughs> so I, I went over to the driver's side and the man was in the driver's seat and I tapped on the window and he rolled the window down and, and I said hi I said are you from Florida or is this a rental car and he said no we're from Florida and I said oh I see you have the dolphin plates so you obviously care about animals Yes, we love animals. I said, that is so great. You know, thank you for getting those dolphin plates. And I love that you're that caring, that you were willing to pay a little bit extra to support that kind of conservation. I said, since you are so caring and you care about animals 
so much. I have an invitation for you. And they had big smiles. I, I think they were hoping I was inviting them to a party by 11. And I said, here's my invitation. The next time that you're at a computer, because you are so caring, you will want to do this. Do some research on the amount of violence and suffering that went into your coats. Because you are such caring people that I know you will want to act on that caring. And so I just invite you to do that. And the guy looked a little stunned, and he looked straight forward, and the window started to go up, and I just said, thank you for being caring enough to look into this. And the woman looked me right in the eye and said, thank you. Thank you so much. So that's who we get to speak to. We get to speak to that compassionate core in people. I think that it's um, it's not always easy. And I always think that it's important to remember that five minutes before you were vegetarian or you were vegan or you were an animal rights activist, five minutes before you had that awareness and acted on it, you didn't. And think about what it is in your past that brought you to the place that you are now. Was it someone making you feel like you are a horrible person, you're worthless, or is it that someone invited you to a possibility? And that's what we get to do. I totally forgot I even had a PowerPoint up here. Um, <laughs> I'm not used to having one in the webinar. It's great. So there's, um, I talked about this a little bit before, about these dominant thoughts. Things should be different than they are. I have no power to change them. I do not make a difference. These are really strong thoughts that often go together with despair. And I'm sure that lots of you can recognize yourself in that. Um, there are also, really there's um, people who are in different places. So most people, this is the majority, don't understand the issues thoroughly and do not know what they can do to make a difference. For those of you who are on their phone, I'm taking these right off the PowerPoint. Um, and most people assume that some expert is going to come along and fix the situation. They do not feel empowered to be the one who is going to fix the situation. They don't feel that they're the co-creator of what's to come. So that's most people. That is the majority. Many people understand the issues and think that things are so screwed up that it's pointless to do anything. And many people do not realize the power of their own actions and their effect on the group. So I want to talk about this effect on the group. If, if you ever want to see some really wonderful video or read about some great studies, there are these great studies called the, the Bad Apple Study. Or, you know, There's lots of different names for it. But the Bad Apple Study, if you look that up, you're going to love it. So in the Bad Apple Study, um, they have all of these people who are meeting in a boardroom. They have one person who's an actor who comes in. And that person who comes in intentionally is negative, is a downer, is like the bad apple, is kind of sour. And what they've done is they've filmed this in the studies, and even the strongest people end up in a very short time giving in to that bad apple, that they all start to they hang their heads down, they all start to feel negative, they all give up hope. So that's the power of the bad apple. But what is wonderful is that the power of the good apple is just as powerful. One person has a really strong effect on the group. I think that we often think, oh, I'm just one person. So what the majority is doing or feeling is more important than what me as an individual is doing or feeling. We don't realize the power that we have to reshape a situation, to make it into a loving situation, a compassionate situation, a powerful, powerful co-creation of what we want the situation to be. So I think it's really important that people understand their power. So this is a really beautiful Albert Schweitzer quote that I have up on the PowerPoint right now, and it says, however much concerned I was 
at the problem of misery in the world. I never let myself get lost in the broodings over it. I always held firmly to the thought that each one of us can do a little to bring some portion of it to an end. I love that one. So right now, up on the PowerPoint, it says, for those of you on the phone, I'll just tell you what it says. It says, stop all wars. And then below that, it says, start all peace. And I have this up here for a reason. I was asked to speak at this human rights festival. And there was this huge banner on the stage. And the big banner said, stop all wars. And I didn't actually see the banner because there was a big crowd of people. I didn't see it until I was going up to speak. So I'm heading up there and I see stop all wars. And I think, oh, huh, that's kind of challenging, stop all wars. So I totally scrapped what I was going to talk about at the Human Rights Festival. And I asked the people who are in the audience, how many of you feel like you could stop all wars? And not a single hand went up. Not one out of thousands of people who were in the audience. Then I said, okay, I want you to turn around the first word and the last word to their opposite. So I want you to change stop all wars to start all peace. Then I asked again of the audience, how many of you feel like you could start all peace? And thousands of hands went up. And I realized that we have to take things one step at a time. Every action of ours can start peace. We can start all peace. The idea of stopping all wars, overwhelming. The idea of starting all peace, oh, it can start right now. It can start with me. It can start with my interactions with who I live with. It can start with what I do outside of my home. Every day, all day, I can make that choice. Oh, am I going to start war here? Or am I going to start peace in this moment? And the power of doing that is incredible. To stop and to say, oh, I can, I can do this in a peaceful way. So one of the ways of doing that is to get to know the issues thoroughly, really get to know the issues, and discuss them openly and without judgment or anger. This is a practice, and it's a wonderful practice, and it can take time. It's also important to remember where you have been on your own path. Don't expect people to get it right away. We can meet someone, and we want them in five minutes to understand what may have taken us 40 years of our own process to get to, um, you know, for me, almost 60 years of my own process. And I can't meet someone and hope that in five minutes they're going to just get it. So don't expect them to get it right away. When people are interested in doing more, which some people are, they say, I'm interested, I really want to do this, then help empower them with everyday choices they can make in their own lives. And one of the most important ones is be a living example of joyfully and consistently living your values. I call this the human billboard. It's the most powerful thing that we can do on the planet is to show up as an example of love, of joy, of peace, of healthiness. Um, Right now in the PowerPoint, I have the cover of the book called The Tipping Point by Malcolm Gladwell. And if you haven't read this book, I recommend it. If you don't have time to read it, you don't have to read it. But I will tell you this about the tipping point. Very often our despair comes from feeling like we are such a minority. And, you know, oh my God, there's such a small percentage of us who are actually, you know, living a compassionate lifestyle, making compassionate choices, caring about other species, caring about the planet. And we forget that a tipping point is not about 50% of the population being on board. When human slavery was abolished in the U.S., when it was made illegal, only 13% of the population was behind it. 13%. That's a very small percentage. It was enough to tip the scales. That was the tipping point for slavery in the U.S., And once it tipped and it became illegal and, you know, people pretty much were on board with this, not everyone, of course, 
But everyone said, oh, yes, I've been behind that all along. Suddenly everybody wanted to be on the right side of justice, but only 13%. So it's really important to not pay too much attention to those percentages because we don't know when the tipping point is coming. It's coming tomorrow or in a month or in a year. We don't know. So now up on the PowerPoint, I have one of my favorite Wendell Berry poems. It says, when despair for the world grows in me, I go and lie down where the wood drake rests in his beauty on the water, and the great heron feeds. I come into the peace of wild things. I come into the presence of still water. For a time, I rest in the grace of the world, and I'm free. This is so powerful, because often when we feel despair, we, we do things that aren't healthy. We don't go spend time with the most beautiful parts of the planet. We don't go spend time with what feeds our soul on the deepest level. That's when people do things like, well, I'm going to turn on the TV. I'm going to eat crap that isn't good for me. This is when people start to do unhealthy things, is when they feel that despair. So that's the moment when you want to eat that food that you know isn't good for you and makes you feel horrible. When you want to go turn on the TV instead of walking out your door and sitting under a tree, looking up at the sky. Stop yourself and give yourself that gift of really doing what feeds you. So think about what makes you feel the most recharged and the most alive. Take time out to have fun, to breathe, spend time with the most beautiful parts of the earth, and also to celebrate the accomplishments Celebrate how far we've come in so many areas of social justice. You know, we spend a lot of time looking at how far we have to go, and that contributes to despair. We sometimes have to turn back, turn back and look at how far we've come. When I first became vegan, I didn't know the word vegan, but I was vegan. I didn't know a single other vegan. You never saw the word anywhere. Now... Look around. It's everywhere. Um, You can be in the least progressive parts of the U.S. and you are still going to walk into a grocery store and you're probably going to find absolutely everything you want in that grocery store. It's not everything you want. You're at least going to find some wonderful alternatives to the, the foods that are usually in those stores. Things are changing. They're changing so quickly. I can't keep up with the vegan blogs, books, celebrities. All of it. I don't know most of the activists. I don't know most of the people anymore. I used to think I knew every vegan in the world. And there's a good chance that I did. So it's really important to celebrate how far we've come in a relatively short amount of time. And it's also important to remember that peace does not mean to be in a place where there's no noise, no violence, no trouble, no pain, no hard work. It means to be in the midst of all those things and to find a way to be calm in your heart. And it's, it's just powerful. If you can find tools to do that, and there are tools, and it's, it's a practice. It takes work to find that place of loving calmness and a place where you can be in a situation and something is coming at you, and rather than reacting with anger and judgment, that you say, okay, I want to understand this person. You know, people come up to us all the time at our table when we're tabling, and they say those things that many of us have heard. And, you know, sometimes our first reaction is, what an idiot, you know, they don't know anything. You know, how could they be saying this? You know, and and one of the most common is, you know, oh, I could never give up cheese. Oh, you know, I'm vegetarian, I just eat chicken. You know, all these different things that people say. And what we get to do is to try to understand them, to talk to them in a way that helps them question themselves. You don't need to really question them too much, but just enough to understand them. So, you know, JC and I were tabling, and a woman came up, and she said that line about chicken, and she said, oh, I'm vegetarian, pretty much. I just eat chicken. And I said, oh, how did you choose chicken as the animals who you would eat of all the animals that you could choose? And the woman said, well, you know chickens. And I said, I do know chickens. She said, well, you know, they're, you know, stupid. 
And I said, oh. I said, I have a really different experience of chickens. Tell me about your experience with chickens. And she said, what do you mean? I said, oh, just tell me how you came to the conclusion that they're stupid. And she got real quiet. She said, well, I don't know. I don't have any experience with chickens. And I said, oh, do you want to hear about some of my friends who happen to be chickens? And she said, yes. And then I told her some stories of some of my amazing feathered friends and their intelligence and their caring and, you know, what they love. And and she listened really closely. And then she said, oh, I, I guess I don't eat chicken. And I said, oh, that sounds right. And she just kind of walked away from the table in kind of a floaty little daze. You know, she arrived at the table eating chicken. And it wasn't because I said, oh, you're a bad person for eating chicken. I said, oh, what's your, how did you choose that? How did you come to that conclusion? So this idea of understanding people really, it helps them. It helps us. It's a much kinder interaction. And it's one that keeps their process going of questioning what they're doing instead of shutting down their heart because, you know, they might feel judged. So this is a really wonderful quote that I love that I have up on the PowerPoint now. Um, And it's from Mary Oliver. And it says, tell me what it is you plan to do with your one wild and precious life. We're here. We're here for who knows how long. And we get to be the co-creators. That is the beautiful part. We get to co-create what this planet is becoming. Sometimes we forget. We're not empowered enough to realize that we're the co-creators. But we are. And the more that we communicate with love and the more that we communicate with understanding, the quicker that tipping point is going to show up. I actually have the feeling that the tipping point is right around the corner. I'm starting to feel that, and I know other people who uh, have been in this movement for a long time who are also feeling it. And, you know, one of my friends, Joanne Farr, probably a lot of you know of her work, uh, she said something in an email the other day that I loved because when she talked about feeling this tipping point coming toward compassionate living and Somebody said, oh, are you kidding? And they started bringing up everything, the people who are paleo, who like to butcher their own animals, da-da-da-da-da. And she said, oh, that's the last gasp of a dying paradigm. And I loved that. I'm like, oh, the last gasp of a dying paradigm. You know, and I just thought, oh, it's true. And that's, even though it may get our attention, it's that thing I was talking about, about what are we focusing on? It gets our attention when we see those things. But it's not the most powerful force on the planet. The most powerful force in the direction that we're heading is toward more compassion and more love and our circles of compassion widening further and further. And you see it in cultures where you never would have imagined it. You know, the animal rights movement in Italy is huge. And if somebody had asked me, would that be one of the centers in terms of power in the animal rights movement? If somebody had asked me that, 15 years ago, I would have said, I don't think so. You know, I think that could be possibly one of the last places getting on board. And it's not true. So I want, there's another concept that I want to talk to you about just and, and really close with that. Let's see what our last PowerPoint is. Oh, for those of you who can't see the PowerPoint, I'll tell you what it is. It is um, a sign that's on a tree. And <laughs> it's like for um, a trail. And it says, to the left, there's an arrow that says more difficult. To the right, there's an arrow and it says less difficult. And I love this sign because I feel like we get to choose what that path is going to be. Are we going to choose the more difficult path with more conflict, more anger, more negativity? Or are we going to choose the less difficult path, the one where we feel fed, healthy, rested, joyful, and we're still doing our work and more effectively. So that is, I want to end talking about um, this idea that many of us have that we're such a small percentage. And I came up with this at a conference last year. It just came to me. And I thought of us as the board of directors. The board of directors does not sit around the board table in the boardroom and think, oh, 
for us. There's so few of us, and there's so many of them. No way. They think, oh, we are the board of directors. We're the powerful decision makers. Let's find out what our best skills are as a board. Let's use them to our best ability, and let's do what we were put on the planet to do. That's what a board of directors does. They're powerful. But they do not think about whether they're the minority or the majority. And that is who we are. All of us who are on this call right now. Everybody who is working to create a more compassionate world. It's really an honor. It's an honor that we have been given the awareness and the skills to be educating the public about ways to be more loving. And I know it doesn't always feel like an honor. It can feel like a burden. But we get to choose how we're going to think about it. This is an honor that we get to be a voice for the beings on the planet and for the earth herself who often has a voice that's not heard in society. We get to be that voice. We are the board of directors. We're so powerful. So don't squander that power. Don't feel like, oh no, I'm just little old me and I don't make any difference. You make all the difference in the world. And it's a really important thing to remember. I'm so grateful that you're here on this call. And uh, now can we open it up to questions that people might have? Yeah, this is Cheryl. Hi, Cheryl. Hi, Cheryl. Hi. Hey, I am. Um, it's so, that was so, so beautiful. So beautiful. Mm. It's so funny because I love that. I love that compassionate heart thing uh, so much. So great. I mean, I, I, I'm, I, this is not a question. This is just me sharing this because it was so synchronistic for you to be sharing about that. I literally was in this Walmart, like, leafleting people, and I was talking to this woman about, she actually started talking to me about Tyson and all this stuff about Tyson and just all this stuff, and I was just like, oh, my gosh, oh, my gosh, this is like, I don't know. I really wish I could have be able to be more, I wasn't not compassionate to her. I was definitely compassionate to her. But it was just like what you said. I mean, I have however many years I've had of my experience of whatever my experience was. And I totally forgot not to, you know, like I download this information on people, expecting them to get it. I mean, it wasn't one of those particular cases. But this is just, you know, a really great reminder. And if there's, the question is, is there any way for me to really be able to remind myself how to implement that effectively in my life so I don't forget it would be really awesome because I immediately <laughs> don't do that, I think. You know, thank you Cheryl, so I think, much. Though. Thank you, Cheryl. You know, I think that it is a practice. And... You know, there are times when you're going to walk away from a situation and go, oh, I could have handled that so differently, you know, that hindsight thing. And all of us have experienced that. And as you practice it over time, what's really good to do is as you walk away, check in with yourself and think about, oh, what was my intention in that interaction right. and how did it show up? And over time with practicing it, you will get, it won't feel fake at all you will feel genuinely interested in how does that feel for you? You know, you will ask people, how does that feel? You know, the people who say, oh, I, I used to be vegan. You know, there's a lot of that. And then I say, oh, what changed for you? I want to know. I want to understand it. And I'll say, oh, what changed for you? And then they share what changed. And, you know, I've, I've said to people, oh, that must be so sad to have to turn away from your most loving values to do this thing that you feel is necessary now. I hope that you get to come back to living your most loving values one day. And I mean it. Wow. You know, I genuinely mean it for this person because I feel bad for them. Like You know the joy of lining up your values with your actions. 
that kind of alignment feels fabulous. So the opposite often doesn't feel good, you know, for any of us. And that's the part of them I want to speak to. I just really want to understand them. And and I think that it happens with practice. You know, I used to be, you know, pretty confrontational. <laughs> and it didn't have really have good results. And it caused me more despair. Because not only was this person not on the same page with me, but I just walked away and I did everything I could to shout my ideas at them or to force my ideas on them. And they didn't take any of them. You know, so it's um, it's sort of a lose-lose in that one. And the other one's just such a win-win because I understand their choices better and they have an opportunity to ask themselves the same questions I'm asking them to understand themselves better. So that's, really, that's, that's a win-win. <coughs> That's such a good point. I um, I really appreciate that. I was. This is my last question. I promise you guys, but this I actually forgot about. And so this is a question. It's not a big question, but I was. Have, I know this woman here who's a holistic doctor who's absolutely, you know, insists that people need to eat meat. And I'm like, you know what? We really like don't agree about this. And you know, and like she just has this. It's just an interesting, her behavior about the whole thing is really, you know, interesting. She's really, like, attached to it and believes it and has all this information to prove it and all that. And and then I just said, so this is this was kind of, like, my question is, like, what do you think of this? I really got, like, like, later on I thought to myself, you know, this aspect of people looking at themselves as their lives are so so important and their health is so important, which I don't deny that people shouldn't make themselves quote-unquote important to themselves or the world or their family or whatever they make themselves important to and how their health is so important. But it's like, Mm -hmm. I just said, you know, you're like really to me, and I don't know, I didn't say it like this, you're missing like a critical piece here in the bigger picture and there's a really bigger picture that you're really missing. I don't know exactly how to describe it, but you're really missing it. Mm-hmm. There's just mm-hmm. a bigger picture. Like, you know, I feed my dogs. I take care of my clients. They all need to eat meat. and Just this mantra. And I'm like, you're missing it. And, I, you know, that's just, like, like that's just it, you know. Like, mm. I don't know. Anyhow... It's been really interesting because she. The reason why she connected with me originally is to tell me that there's vegan restaurants in like Disney World, and I was like, you know what? <laughs> That's great. I go. It would be great if you supported people that ate vegan diets. That would be way more important to me than you telling me that there's vegan food at Walt Disney World. I said, you. I just don't feel like you support people that eat vegan diets, and you know, because you got like mm-hmm. a story about it. So that's kind of like a little interesting and I don't feel like you know like I'm making her wrong or I'm like sitting there with my machine gun gunning her down I'm just really (laughs) doing my best to understand her too Mm. you know I think what struck me in what you said was um, you said that she is missing a bigger picture and I think that we are all you know we all have stories and we are all missing a, a bigger picture so when I talked in the the beginning about how we all have, you know, our hierarchy of caring. We think that others have it and we don't, but it really helps in not judging others, you know, because we all have beings and things that we care about more than others, and, and right. so there's always a bigger picture that we're missing with our stories. There's, um, Lisa's going to send a link to the work of Byron Katie, mm-hmm. and um, Byron Katie does what is called the work, and Right, you know, you can do it. You can do it free online, and it's really helpful in situations like that. Because then, I often will just turn it around to myself, and I'll go, "Oh, hmm, she's missing a bigger picture. Hmm, what bigger picture am I missing?" You know, I often do that. Like, I'll just turn it around to me, and I'll nice. go, oh, yeah, "There's a bigger picture I'm missing too," and it's helpful. It's just helpful in you know addressing those situations in the most loving way. So, was that Thank rude you. that I said that? Do you think? No, no. You, you know, you do whatever you feel is right at the time, and then you get to feel like, oh, what? 
how did that land for her? What was her reaction to that? Did it keep the communication open? You know, often it's it's more important to keep that connection open with the person. You know, I feel like there's this, this door here, you know, this heart door. And when we first meet someone, it cracks open a little bit. And they're like, oh, yeah, I'll open that heart door a little bit. And then our interaction with them either makes it swing wide open, where we're open, we help each other become more compassionate, we're open to each other's ideas, or, oh, it slams shut. And we know when we're talking to someone which one is happening. So, you know, I think it's like what I said, it's just a practice, you know, and I've walked away from some things and thought, oh, God, that heart door just slammed right shut. Because I could feel I was judging the person and they could feel it. You know, and then there's times when I just figure it out and I'm able to, you know, what I try to do is instead of fighting people, is invite them to a possibility. Um, And for me, that has more longevity. It's how I've been able to do this work for 40 years, is that rather than feeling like I'm in a constant battle and I'm fighting, I more get to be the one who invites them to this incredible loving possibility. And uh, it's a lot easier to go through life that way. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. You know, I want to address... um, Erica Hum, Erica, are you in Hamburg or Erica, are you from Hamburg? I see you in the chat box, and maybe you're not on where your voice is on. Are you there? So, I, Lisa, mm-hmm. is it okay if I read what's in the chat box, or was it just? Yes, yes, yes. Um, let's see. I, you'll notice if it's in white, it was sent to everyone, and if it's in green, it was just sent to you, or a different color. Oh, so okay. I believe so Erica, that, that it was sent to everyone. Yeah. Okay, so Erica, I hope it's okay if I talk about this. Um, it says, my despair comes from monitoring the decimation of African wildlife, helpless against the Asian demand, the corrupt governments, the serious declines. Um, you know, I don't need to say the rest in it, but um, what This is what we're all looking at. This is, we have never before been in a time when we are witnessing what's going on globally. And that's part of what causes people despair. You're not just seeing the cruelty or the violence in your own neighborhood or in your own region. We are aware on a global level of the amount of suffering on the planet. And because that is so big and it is not really a natural thing for us to have to handle that amount of information, we have to balance that out even more with what might feel like an unnatural amount of self-care, meditation, yoga, hiking, whatever it is that makes you feel really alive the balance actually has to go quite the opposite. And you're going to feel like it's frivolous. You're going to feel like, oh, in this time when I'm, you know, out hiking or I'm dancing, you know, I'm rock climbing or I'm kayaking, this time I could be working on these issues. I could be at the computer working on this, 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 and this. But the reality is you will have no longevity and you will not be as effective if you don't really tip the balance the other way. Um, and I'm not just saying this to you, Erica, but your beautiful message is what made me think about this. You know, the amount that we are carrying is more than any human has in human history in terms of knowing what's going on on the planet. And it's really important to do self-care during that because you are this this powerful voice and we need your voice and we need it healthy and strong and rested. Well, we have a couple of questions that I can share with you from the chat line. And one of them was regarding uh, how to how to handle uh, folks, for example, it was um, Christine was I'm sharing for it on the how to... Time. It's It's from Christine Perry and it says how to deal with friends and family who simply laugh, laugh you off as the animal person. 
um, and mm. that's very discouraging and how to um, you know speak to people she's from Texas about about some of these issues um, and I mm. I have a little little announcement for you Christine I just wanted you to know there's in El Paso there's a group called the Vegetarian Society of El Paso and next Saturday they're having a compassionate Thanksgiving and I'll be speaking there about uh, you know how to about some of these issues so if you're interested or able to attend that that would be a good resource for you to be surrounded by people who are like-minded so Ray what do you have to say about that question well, you know, family is the most, when I do communication workshops, guaranteed for everyone, their family is the most challenging. And that is not because they happen to be the most challenging people on the planet. It's because of our expectation of our families. So again, that despair, the difficulty isn't caused by what they're doing as much as our reaction and our ex- expectation that my family should understand me, they should know who I am at my core. Uh, you know, families are, they are the number one most challenging because they're the ones we want to know us. This is my family. So I have, you know, for years, have sort of divided the world into blood family and chosen family. And it's been really helpful. Um, I now have blood family who are, who really understand what I'm doing. But for many, many years, my blood family were the ones who challenged my choices the most. Uh, You know, around the holidays, it gets difficult. You know, everybody knows this. And it's mostly because of our expectation of that family. When you say, oh, I have chosen family, and that's what you focus on, you will be overwhelmed by your compassionate loving chosen family they're so huge you can't even do like you can't maintain the relationships because that compassionate family is so big and the other family really they're just doing the best with what they know and the people who tease you may be the ones they're often the ones who we might consider to be a lost cause but they're often the ones who are in their process. They have to dismiss what you're doing because it makes too much sense to them. And, you know, I've I've seen this a lot, not just with family, but with people who, I used to think that there were lost causes. Now I know there aren't any lost causes. And the the first boy who taught me that, I used to do humane education programs in all the schools, and there was a boy, I was doing this humane education program in his school, it was a high school, and he was saying the most violent things about what he does to animals. Horrible things. You know, oh, I take the chickens and I just grab them by the neck and I yank their heads off. And, I mean, he was saying all these horrible things. And in my head, it was still back when I thought there were lost causes and I thought, lost cause. That one's a lost cause. And then years later, I was with my stepdaughter and we went into the animal shelter in that region. And this, we were looking for a dog to adopt and this guy came up to me and he said, do you recognize me? And I said, you look kind of familiar, but I really don't recognize you. He said, I was that horrible kid in the high school class. And then I remembered him. I said, oh my God, you were like the violent kid, the like pull the chicken's heads off kid. He said, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. He said, but I just want to tell you that, that when you came to our classroom, it changed my life. But that day... Everything in me was fighting it, and I didn't want to feel what I felt. So that's how I reacted. But now, he said, I'm vegan, I come volunteer here, and I was just blown away. And what that kid now, you know, young man taught me was there are no lost causes. You don't know what's going on inside someone. If you are challenging them in a way just by who you are, if you are challenging them to look in their heart, whoa, that is difficult for people. And they're going to tease you. They're going to do anything so they don't have to look in their heart. Anything. And I know that it's heartbreaking um, when people do this, when they tease you about something that's at your core. It's your core heart belief. And that is part of our practice, is to hear that, 
to not take it personally and to understand that that is that person's process. It has nothing to do with us. And all we have to do, our job, is just to keep being consistent with our values and to show up loving. That's it. And, you know, it it used to be difficult for me when family would challenge it. I'd think, oh, these are the people who are supposed to love me the most. But that's a story. Why are they the people who are supposed to love you the most? They're the people who are stuck with you, but they're not the ones who are supposed to love you the most. That's a story that we have in our heads. Mm-hmm. Now, I remember my father was, not happy with me when uh, I didn't want to come to Thanksgiving one year. He said, oh, you care about your animal rights more than you care about family. And he's such a wonderful guy. He's always questioning things, and he's got an open heart and an open mind, and I love it. So we can discuss things. And he said, so you care more about your animal rights than your family? I said, oh, well, I guess I, I care about my values, and I like to be consistent with my values. But I would say that you care more about your taste buds than your family because the fact that there's going to be a a dead turkey on the table means that there's going to be a lot of your family not showing up. So I guess I'd rather say that I care about my being consistent with my values more than getting together with the family rather than saying my taste buds are more important than the family. And he was like, oh, all right, babe, you know, whatever. You know, but, but he... He did think about it. We did talk about it. And, you know, and then I thought, it's not personal. When he said that to me, what's really at his core is, I love my family. I want them all together. It wasn't personal about me. Um, but it is, it can be hard when people do the joking thing. And the, and you just have to stay true to your core. And, and one day, it may be a decade from now, that person who's teasing you is going to be able to see that they actually respect you and that you're consistent with your values and your choices are not easy, but that they're compassionate. Mm -hmm. And someone had also asked about what to do, how to decline an invitation. And uh, if somebody invites you, for example, your family to Thanksgiving, how to decline that. Uh, it's just a, a little bit related to the previous question. If, you, yeah, if you're planning yeah. to be with another another group or mm-hmm. if you would, uh, are wanting to be um, not around animal suffering on that holiday. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I think that the best way to do that, there's so many ways to handle that. And I think that for me, the most loving way, because I've had to do this, is to say, I would love to be with you not under those circumstances, but I would love to be with you, so let's plan another time together where it's not gathering around something that is so heartbreaking for me. And so let's figure out a time that we can get together and just really be together. You know, because what Mm -hmm. that person's intention is is that they want to be with you and you want to be with them. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't have to be at that time. It doesn't have to be around that event around that food. It doesn't even have to include food. Mm-hmm. You know, so I, I think that it's really good to acknowledge the love that is between you and that person and the desire to connect that they're sharing with you and that you can share back without having to necessarily have it be during that time and around mm-hmm. that sort of situation. And another question that came up was how how do we handle it when people actually make fun of our vegan values? It could be our family, it could be friends. Um, how to handle that without getting tongue tied? I think that sometimes it's good to have a little um, tool bag with your mm-hmm. <laughs> like responses for different situations, and uh, so in those situations. And it's become heartfelt now. It used to be like what was in my tool bag, but now it is coming right from my heart. And I will, when someone does that, I will look right in their eyes and say, oh, what would make you say that to me? Hmm. And that usually stops them in their tracks. Well, you know, you know what would make me say that. And they'll say, well, no, I don't actually. If you know that this is something that is at my deepest core, what would make you say that to me? I'm curious. And they usually 
the only response to that makes them have to kind of look at what would make me say that, you know? And it usually makes them tongue-tied, so you don't have to be the tongue-tied one. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'll, I'll give that one a try. <laughs> <laughs> I think you'll like the results. <laughs> yeah. Um, someone asked, I think Suzanne um, Marsh asked, uh, do we just bring our own food to the holiday meal and that sort of thing? Um, since the other items are perhaps animal-based. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, people have to do what they're comfortable doing. Um, I I have gone to holiday meals that included animal products and not felt good about it afterwards, you know, even though I brought food. and So for me, that doesn't really work because for me, looking at who has been killed and put in the middle of the table for the celebration, when I look at that being, it is it changes the whole uh, energy of that event for me. And so it's it's not worth it for me to just, like, bring bring my vegan food and, and do that. What I have done a lot in the past is I host the holiday meal. Mm-hmm. And... So I just host it, and it's vegan, and everybody's so happy that they don't have to cook. And, <laughs> you know, so that that has worked really well, is that I host it. But, you know, for me it works, it just works much better to gather with those same people if they are people who I want in my life and gather with them under different circumstances than, you know, to put myself through having to witness that. I mean... You know, as everyone who's listening probably knows, you know, we can't even look at a glass of milk without seeing mm. the whole history of mm. what did it take to produce, what was down the road to produce that glass of milk. It's it's not so innocent to us. So, you know, of course people are going to tease us for that and call us oversensitive or whatever. And, and all. I just call it awareness. We just have an awareness about it. And mm-hmm. with that awareness, we don't have to gather and, and celebrate with people around those things. And and if people mm. are more comfortable doing that and bringing vegan food, if you're comfortable doing that, by all means, you know, do it because then people will taste your wonderful vegan food. And, you know, that's always a good thing. Um, but it mm. certainly isn't, I don't think anybody should ever feel obligated to have to do that. Mm. And one thing I'll share with people, it might it might be interesting to look around in your area and find out if there is a Thanksgiving, a vegan Thanksgiving event going on. I know in the Los Angeles area where I am, we have a, a Thanksgiving that's been going on for 20 or 30 years that actually there's three or 400 people that come to it. And it's okay. another alternative. So I've shared with my family that I, I, I don't, I don't um, spend Thanksgiving with them, and and when they asked why, I would explain it's not a it's not a, a pleasant <laughs> holiday for me because I'm thinking about the creature that you're eating, and so it mm-hmm. it didn't work for me to be there. Um, that I wasn't going to be a happy presence at their meal because I would be sad. So mm-hmm. I chose to spend the holidays with other like-minded people, so I can be happy and enjoy it and celebrate the compassionate choices that we've made. Um, And I will let you know that this Thanksgiving, our animal activist online support group will be having a meeting. (laughs) So if you are going through issues with your family or feel alone on the holidays, just join the call. It's the same as this webinar. You'll you'll get a, um, once you register, you'll get a call-in number and we'll be there. I'll be with you. We'll be spending Mm -hmm. the Thanksgiving together. And uh, coincidentally, our our meeting falls on Christmas Eve as well. So we we've got those mm-hmm. two holidays covered. If you'd like to spend it in the company of other um, vegans right. or people who are on the path, then you can do that. You know, Lisa. I also want to add: if there isn't currently uh, Thanksgiving, we call it Thanks Living here. If there isn't a Thanks Living celebration in your area. You can create it. You will be amazed. Mm-hmm. You will find um, if you put it out there. You can put it out there as a meetup. You can, you know, if you know the meetup site, um, you can go there. You can create it as a meetup event. You can do it as a Facebook event. 
And I think that you will be really surprised at how many people come out of the woodwork and join you. So, you know, you can feel empowered to do that if there isn't already someone doing it in your area. Yeah, I love that idea. Oh, somebody's joining us. This is Angie. I'm from Santa Fe, too. Hi, Ray. Hi, Angie. Hi, Angie. Wonderful talk. Thank you so much. And really timely. I've been feeling very despairing about the state of the world lately. So I feel very uplifted. Thank you for all the wisdom. Um, I have one quick question. I have um, gotten quite a few of of this question in, with challenging me of, um, well, plants have feelings too and you're still killing things. You're killing a plant. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. you kill things to eat, just like mm-hmm. I do. So mm-hmm. I'm just curious. I've come up with different responses <laughs> to it depending on my mood. But, um, you know, how, how do you handle that question? Mm-hmm. So, of course, I've had the same one <laughs> come at me many times over the years and decades. And what I usually say is I agree, you know, that I would like to save as many plants as possible, do the least harm possible, and that is one of the major reasons that I love eating lower on the food chain, that I am doing so much less harm to plants and all life on the planet. Uh, You know, so that's a very easy response in that way. You know, it takes so many more plants when we eat animals, it takes so many more plants recycling through them for us to get that food. So we're actually saving a lot of plants by choosing to eat lower on the food chain and, and eat a plant-based diet. Um, mm-hmm. I also think that it's interesting. It's an interesting question. Like, And I like the this image. Like if you put a rabbit in front of a person, it can be a baby or an older person, doesn't matter. If you put a beautiful rabbit in front of that person or a calf, and then you put a bunch of carrots. Um, very few people are going to pet the carrots and kill and eat the animal who's in front of them. Um, you know, like how we're built, how our hearts are built, and our, um, you know, we're drawn to to eat the carrot and care for the rabbit or the calf. Um, That's pretty much who we are at our core. But, you know, if you want to keep it to the simple answer, you can just say you're saving more plants by eating lower on the food chain. Good one. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Ray. Thank you, Angie. Thanks for being here. Yes. Yeah. Thanks. So I'm just noticing the time, and although we would love to spend the rest of our mm-hmm. lives together, <laughs> really just um, <laughs> reflecting or basking in the glow of this kind of solidarity and, and group harmony, um, we do have to end our call eventually <laughs> because we just want uh, Ray to continue enjoying for night and everyone else here. And uh, I want to thank everyone for participating in this. We've had yeah. such a lively discussion um, mm-hmm. together with Ray on the phone and also on the chat box. So what we'll be doing is in a, a week or so, you'll receive a wonderful letter so I hope you read the email that will um, mention the replay link for this sustainable activism webinar. It will also announce our next one, um, which will be on December, uh, I believe it's the 3rd, and we'll have a woman named Ruth Ha who's traveling here from England, and she's going to share her ideas of vegan topia. So that'll be interesting. <laughs> so you'll get an email with information about this next webinar, but also with all of the links and wonderful resources that Ray has put together for this webinar, including the replay of what she's just said today. So you'll be able to listen or watch it again whenever you like. So stay tuned for that coming up. And um, can I say something about that letter? Yes, that yes. Um, 
I'm on a Facebook sabbatical right now, so that's the way that a lot of folks used to reach me, but I'm on Facebook sabbatical until next year. So my email will be included in that letter, and if you have questions or comments or anything that you want to run by me, please feel free to just email me and contact me that way because... The Facebook sabbatical, I have to tell you, is wonderful. <laughs> um, but you can't reach me that way for a while. Uh, well, thank you for letting us know, Ray. And and we will um, share all of the information, including another Mary author poem with you in that email. Uh, so it's just my honor to thank Ray for sharing your wisdom with us. It, it was, I think everyone... At least I can speak for myself. I definitely learned something, and I, I felt mm -hmm. some, something too, which is often more important than what we learn. Um, so thank you for sharing your thank wisdom you, and Lisa. your presence. Thanks. With us. Thank you. And if if anybody wants to, you can unmute yourself so we can have a group goodbye. Now, uh, if you're online, you can click <laughs> the little uh, icon, which looks like a microphone, and then it will unmute you. If you're on your phone. You can click star six and that will unmute you. And then if you're able to do that, we can just have a group goodbye and hopefully we'll see you at the next webinar or one of our uh, activist support group or any of the other events. Thank Again, you, Ray. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you Ray. Thank you, much. everyone. Bye-bye. Woo-hoo! Have a great day. So much. Bye, everyone. Thanks. Goodbye. <laughs> have a great night, guys. Yay. Good night, everyone. Bye, Bye everyone. Bye. Love you.